Hello, my name is James Young, and welcome to It's a New Day. I am not generally a supporter of government programs, but we have an exception. I have with me today Jackie Campbell, who is the, who is the Assistant Commissioner of Youth Services, and the program that she's going to talk about is something that we all need to know, and I believe we will come to appreciate. I welcome you to the show. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. What I would like for you to do is to give us a brief detail of what it is that you do with the City of Fort or the City of Rochester. Well, um, I am the Assistant Commissioner of Youth Services, as you uh, mentioned. Then, um, basically, I would say that my major responsibilities are to oversee um, some programs that we have with community-based organizations. Uh, some of those programs operate in our facilities. Some of those programs operate within the community-based um, organization, and some operate in schools. Uh, so we have a, probably over $3 million worth of programs that are funded. Okay, very good. Would you please explain to us exactly what is effective black parenting? Well, effective black parenting is the name of a curriculum that we use to um, provide some skills development uh, for uh, African American parents, specifically targeted to them, um, to, so that they can develop their skills to work with their um, students, their children, uh, so that they eventually become successful adults. Why do black families need this program? Well, all parents okay. need uh, parenting skills development. You know, um, when I was younger, they would say, uh, parenting is the, the sort of most important and the hardest job you'll ever have, but it doesn't come with a manual. And actually, there are several manuals that are really good um, curriculums to talk about the developmental process of, of uh, young uh, children and um, how we can best help them in their development, how we can provide the structure and the discipline, some things to do and not to do. And um, all parents could, could utilize that. It states in your brochure that strengthening the black family, or basically all families, that this will avoid uh, stress, pressures. Uh, there's a possibility of children doing better in school. And also, I believe a very important component to this is that it ties into individual culture. But would you begin to go into in depth more about the program and how from early on, perhaps how parenting was one way and how we're moving into another direction? Oh, okay. So, um, you know, I, I, let's, okay, parenting is good for all, all parents. Uh, parenting skills programs are good for all parents. Um, you know, back in the day, we had uh, intact communities. So inside of that community, you would have um, um, the mother, of the um, the young mother engaged, mm -hmm. you would have the grandmother, some aunties were engaged, your whole neighborhood uh, might be engaged and provide some support for the young mother and the young family. So times have changed and we don't necessarily have those kinds of communities anymore. Um, we have a lot of transiency, so folks are, you know, they might be in one particular neighborhood, but they might move around a lot, or um, they might be in a neighborhood without family. Uh, so, so some of the dynamics of how parents develop those skills have changed. Um, what we know from um, the research is that uh, African American uh, children um, probably have some more challenges in terms of their development than other um, uh, children. And um, when you, you know, I mentioned that um, skills development were good for all parents. Uh, there are lots of good curriculums, and I even, when my kids were younger, I participated in a skills development program, um, and it was very good, um, and it, I, it gave me a lot of skills, but when I really, really think about it, there, were, there was a part of it that I wasn't able to engage, um, and some of that was, in, in my family, I was taught, you know, whatever, stay, whatever happens here stays here, and that's something that I, I um, passed on to my children. So when I'm sitting in that program and I'm, I'm learning about things and, you know, there's this piece about corporal punishment, I zone out of that because I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to do what I learned to do, you know. <laughs> and so, and especially someone who is not from my group can't tell me that that's a, not a good thing to do. Corporal punishment. Right. 
And would you explain this to the viewing of the viewing audience from our perspective of how corporal punishment, or just to put it plainly, a good old fashioned spanking, uh -huh. how it was used as a means of protection, putting fear, and why that was put in place? Well, um, uh, you know, I, when, I, when I was growing up, they weren't called spankings. They were called beatings <laughs> and, um, and whoopings. And um, you, um, I can only go back through my own experience. And some of what my, some of my experience um, has been um, um, uh, validated through other people that I know. They've had the same experience. And um, African-American parents and Caribbean-American parents, because my parents were Caribbean, um, tend to um, discipline the primary f uh, form of discipline, um, you know, when you get to that point where you're frustrated, would be it, the belt. You know, the belt was coming out. And sometimes it might not be a belt, it was something else. But something was coming out. And um, part of that is that's learned behavior. Um, and nobody wants to talk about slavery, but that is our, our collective history. If you're on this side of the planet, on this side of the, uh, of the hemisphere, um, you and your, and your African or of African descent, there is a great likelihood that your family has experienced some form of slavery. And so um, what the slaves learned was, um, uh, you know, more of the corporal punishment in terms of um, structure and discipline, different from our, our African heritage. Uh, but when we came out of that, um, you know, we had a fear of what would happen to our young people. And um, so that same kind of punishment was used to have children obey. You know, um, the goal was to have your child bend to your authority before they left your home and had to do it somewhere else. And, and it was a life-saving measure. Um, it was very likely that if they went out and did not know how to um, um, bend to authority, that they might lose their life. So it's not, you know, I try to, to let folks know, it's not that we don't like our children, but this is what we have learned, and it came from a place where we were trying to protect our children. Um, and, you know, the, the curriculum doesn't say that you can't do that. It says that's the last thing that you do. Um, so if you, if you were raised in a household where um, corporal punishment or whooping was that this is the discipline structure, then you are more likely to do that to your, your child. It is, we learn to be parents based on what our parents did with us. That's how I learned to be a parent. I watched my parents. And then when I came of age and I had my own children, I did what they did, because I felt like, well, that worked for me. Um, and it might have worked back then, but there are other things that we need to be using now because we need to parent our children in a different way. Well, um, it, it's, it's uh, um, interesting. When you talk to uh, black parents about the word discipline, they are more likely to say, um, that there is some sort of punishment attached with, with discipline. But when you really look at the word and um, understand what it's supposed to be doing, it is not about how you just um, um, provide a punishment for or a consequence for an activity. It is how you're teaching. You're really teaching your, your children. So um, discipline can be administered in many ways. And there are many forms of loving discipline. Um, and so we are really trying to get our community to understand and embrace that. Because, uh, you know, I always talk about this. Monroe County Jail is full of, of young men that got whoopings. And I'm not blaming parents. I'm not blaming the system. I'm, not, I'm just saying that's a fact. And so when we look at what we want for our children, we have to begin to look at how we instill love, how we teach them to have self-reliance and self-discipline and self-control. What happened is uh, we began a few years ago looking for a curriculum specifically targeted to African-American parents. Um, and we found the curriculum Effective Black Parenting. It was developed by um, this uh, gentleman, um, um, Dr. Uh, Irby from um, California. And Effective Black Parenting is a 12-week curriculum. It's actually a 15-week curriculum, but we've combined a few of them. So we do it in 12 weeks. and. Uh, it starts with an overview of um, where we are as parents right now. Where are we as parents right now? Well, the only reason why I ask that 
So we can give greater emphasis to what effective black parenting is, mm -hmm. because if you don't think mm -hmm. there's anything wrong, you may think you don't need this. Right. And the question itself, or the statement itself, effective black parenting, someone could misinterpret that, well, I'm not effective, <laughs> okay. Absolutely. So. And this is why we call it Strengthening the Black Family, because the, the title itself has been, has this, uh, um, you know, it sounds like uh, you're doing a bad job, so you need to come in here. And actually, what we want to do is strengthen the black family. Um, so what I encourage is for folks to go through it as soon as possible. What, what happens is people tend to want to come to the training when they're having a problem with their child or you know, he just won't mind. And you know, I, I gotta knock him out to get him to mind. And we want you not to, to get to that, that, that level, that stage. You really, as soon, if you're thinking about becoming a parent, you should take this um, program. And the, the um, you know, I mentioned earlier about what we, when I was a kid, you couldn't, you know, I got a woman and I went outside and if I had welts on my leg, I better come up with something. <laughs> because <laughs> it was nobody's business that, exactly. that, ha that happened. Um, and, and some of the things, was, did I need discipline? Absolutely. Were there other ways to do it? Absolutely. But my parents um, pulled out of their, their toolkit what they knew. And I also need to say, because I don't want, you know, folks know my parents, and so I don't want to give the impression that, you know, we just got knocked around all the time, because that's not true. We learned structure, and we had a very secure home, and I learned a whole lot of things from my parents. But I know when I crossed that line, the whooping is what I got, okay? <laughs> and, um, and I, as a um, growing up, I would say, I'm never gonna whoop my kids because I just felt like, oh God, that was just an awful experience. How could you do that? And I know that when my kids were born, I said I wasn't gonna do it, and guess what? That's what I did. I went for the tool that I knew. I went for what I had been taught. And it wasn't until I had gotten some additional skills that I started doing some other, other things. And so, um, it, most parents, most African Americans are like, have the same kind of experience that I have had. And when we talk about the legacy of slavery and the generational uh, trauma that has been handed down, which is really real, um, we know that that is a, um, a circumstance and a condition that happens in a, in a lot of homes. So the training teaches, you know, it's okay for us to talk about it. That's why it's specifically targeted to African-American parents mm -hmm. because um, in another setting, we might not be um, uh, as apt to talk about it, as, as, as able to, to, to confront some of, of this. But together, we, can, we sort of develop this uh, camaraderie in the training. And we talk about some of the issues that we have had regarding some of that kind of discipline. And um, I have not yet um, encountered a parent that likes beating their kids. All parents will tell you, I hate to do it, but this is what I have to do. And if you knew that there was another way, would you d use another, another method? Absolutely. And, you know, um, I had shared this with you. Um, we had gone into Monroe Correctional Facility a few years back to deliver sort of a, um, an abbreviated um, uh, format of this curriculum. And we met with probably 16 women. And of the, the women, um, I would say probably 14 of them were um, parents. And um, all of them have dreams and, and you know, aspirations for their, their children. They have expectations for their children. Um, they all said that they want these really wonderful things for their children, but they all had um, some experience, like my experience, in terms of the, some of the traumatic discipline that they had encountered. And so all mothers want the, what's best for their kids but they want to be able, they should have an opportunity to develop the skills so that they can pick a method <laughs> of, of how you're gonna teach instead of just do, doing what you, what you know. And, and back in the day, um, what you know was good, right? But now, what the, our young people are dealing with are, uh, this is, I can't even tell you some of the things that they're dealing with. And if the only tool you have is one tool, you ain't gonna make it. 
your child is not going to make it. You need to have other tools. You need to be a lot more aware of what's going on. And so the curriculum starts from where we are right now as in terms of a um, where we are as a people, and it talks about the history of where we've come from and what is the foundation that we want to build for our, our children. So there's five values for the curriculum. And the first one is that we want to develop love and understanding. And um, most parents would tell you, I love my child. Not most, all, I love my child. Um, but um, sharing love and teaching love is something that comes difficult for us because our tradition has been that we have to protect rather than to love. You know I love you because I'm gonna give you this whooping so you won't do this other thing. And, um, and our kids need to, to feel love from us in a, in a different way um, in order to get to that next level. So love and understanding is that foundational piece. Before you go any further and talk about the other four components, I, I continue to stop you because I, I want you to really expound deeply, if you will, and I'm, I appreciate you continually saying this, but I think black families need to understand why the whippings took place. It wasn't because we were just upset and we had a bad day and we were taking out our frustrations on our children. We used this type of punishment because we were trying to get them to understand that they have to obey mm -hmm. because once they left outside of the immediate home and because of the conditions that surrounded black people, that if black children didn't know how to be respectful to authority, mm -hmm. there could have been a chance that there, some very damaging things could have happened to them. And I think black families or people that are looking at this that think that black families all they do is beat their kids. Mm -hmm. I think they need to understand the reason why that was. Mm -hmm. And basically it was, as you said, it's not that we didn't love them, but we were trying to protect them. And this is the only way that we knew. Mm -hmm. First, I want to I want to say, it, it, it's, uh, you know, I wasn't above giving my kids a whooping when I had a bad day. OK, so <laughs> I wanted to, to, to clarify that because uh, when you're frustrated, when you're full of stress, you tend to go with what you know. Um, but, um, I, you know, when I think about what I've learned from the curriculum, um, w once I really understood that, it clicked for me Correct. that uh, if you have children um, that you know the world is not fair, you know that, um, you know, if you're a grown man and you are addressed as boy, and you cannot respond. Um, you need to, to make sure that your son understands that when he goes here, he might be not called boy, but when he goes out there, he might have to understand and deal with that. So there are different ways that we chose to, to, to um, reinforce that. But I think that one of the primary reasons we do corporal punishment is because that's what we have learned in terms of, of what can you use to make someone bend to authority. And um, it's different now because kids expect a whooping. You know, yeah. it, it used to be that they would mind that because nobody wanted to, 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 uh, to deal with that. But, you know, I was reading um, recently where um, peer pressure now has become the number one um, influence for, for young people. So it used to be parents. Um, uh, influence or parent pressure or church pressure or some other you know achievement uh, pressure to achieve it's not that any longer so um, you know when you have kids who are saying well a, a whooping is not enough what you gonna do you know break something you know cuz that's where that's where you're headed if if this is the only tool that you have you you know you're, you're likely to do some some serious damage if that's all you're using now um, I know that uh, black folks love their children and um, so I get back to love and understanding because we beat because we love. Now, um, uh, I remember, um, you know, the, I think most folks have heard this term, you know, this is going to hurt me more than it hurt you. And for the most part, that's true because parents don't want to do that. But if that's your understanding of all that you can do in order to stop them from um, or to teach them.
that uh, they need to, to be able to understand authority and, and um, not question rules, um, then that's what you do. And, and um, that was the other part of it. So that, not that they could just um, not question um, authority, um, not, um, you know, uh, it, it's to save their life, but also to understand the way of the world. And if I beat you first, then when you get it from someplace else, you know, it's, it was like you, we were teaching our children. Um, and, and for some time, uh, that, that worked. Um, and it no longer works by itself. It no longer works. So, you know, I try to tell parents when they come into the training, we're not saying that you can't spank, but that should be the last thing that you pull out. And all these other things work much better. And if you use these first, you don't have to get to that. And just like parents love their kids, children adore their parents, and they want to please. And so, um, what is you know these, how they say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery? So our kids love us, and they want to please us. So what do they do? They role model after us. They do what we do. So if we cussing people out, guess what? They are cussing people out left and right because this is what mom and daddy do, so this must be something good because they do it. Um, and that's the other thing. When we teach love and understanding, part of our behavior has to role model that. So when we are um, speaking positively into our children and telling them that they're great, that they can achieve anything, we love them, you know, all of these things, um, they are much more likely to believe that they are loved instead of saying, you know, you gotta, you, you, you can't hear, you just, you know, you don't understand, I gotta keep on your, my foot on your neck to make you do something. All those things that they hear as well, not that they, that they don't feel like they're loved, but it's a contradiction of how you love me and how you speak to me. So um, we teach love and understanding, and that comes through the interaction. And, um, uh, you know, I have, um, um, you know, I, I just had some. I'm having some flashbacks while I'm while I'm here because I I keep thinking about um, how I was with my daughters and and um, and I consider myself to be a very loving um, uh, mother, but I really felt that I needed to teach my daughters how to be strong in the world, and so how to be strong in the world was stop crying. Now I've heard that with um, mothers and sons or fathers and sons. You've got to teach them how to be a man, but you know, it's rough for black women. And so I want you to be able to stand on your own. So suck it up because the world is a hard place. And, um, and I, you know, I, I loved my kids, but because I needed them to be stronger, I wasn't as loving as I could have been. That's not everybody, but I, that was certainly my experience. So when I got to that part of the curriculum, I could definitely understand that there were some things that I could have done differently. So that's the foundation, okay. love and understanding. Um, the other things are um, we have to teach um, pride in blackness. And pride in blackness is um, something that we don't do well as a community. So, you know, we often speak derogatorily about um, males in our community. Um, we use the N word. Um, we um, do a lot of things that talk negatively about our people. And, and our kids are hearing this. So we already know that some other folks don't think as highly as of us, um, but when we re repeat those things, we, we uh, confirm that for them. The other thing that we do is um, we don't have um, uh, good uh, um, examples of, of black art. Like I know a lot of folks that don't have no black art in their home. Um, uh, but so our kids don't see that our art is valuable. Um, we um, don't encourage our children to read our literature, so they don't think our literature has any value. You know, uh, you, you have kids who read all kind of youth books and um, um, different uh, novels and, and some, great, um, some great folks in literature like Shakespeare, but they think that those are the only folks that ever did that, and that's not true. We have some of our own. And, um, and, and we also don't teach about our, our history. So our kids are not, don't have a clear understanding of the greatness of their heritage in terms of, of Africa. And as a matter of fact, when you talk to a lot of kids about that, they're like, oh, that's, 
that's for that's those Africans. That's not me. And absolutely it is. Some of those those traditions that we had in those rituals, they came over on the ship. And they're still part of our culture today. But if you don't teach that, our kids don't know that. I was under the impression um, that kids were learning a whole lot about Martin Luther King and um, Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. And primarily, those are the three African-American heroes and heroes that they, that they learn about in, in school. Um, but there are so much more. So if you, you know, imagine being a young person and feeling that the only people worth studying of my group are these three. What do you think about your, your, your people? What do you think about where you come from? It weighs on your self-esteem. And so what we try to do is to teach parents how you can teach pride and blackness. What are some of the ways that you have conversations even about them? And um, you know, making sure that they um, attend and participate in some of the cultural activities that are in the community. So um, there we have uh, different resources in the community where they can go and learn more about those heroes that they've heard about, um, but they just only heard a snippet about them, and where they can learn about other people. So when we start talking about pride and blackness, it's the whole of our uh, existence, not just right now. We teach um, good health habits, um, good study habits. Before you go into that, let's really talk about the good health habits. Mm -hmm. Um, I had Isaac Collins, who is a social worker for the Rochester City School District, and one of the things that he mentioned on the show was when um, he discovered that parents, as well as their children, were both chemically uh, dependent. And I believe that health has got to be a part of, when we talk about health, that's mm -hmm. got to be a part of it as well the, the way that we eat because mm -hmm. I mean black folks we, we can eat a lot of fried food <laughs> we tend to do that mm -hmm. and I'm not uh, <laughs> I'm not for it's not foreign to me I like yeah, fried food. I'm, I'm guilty of it as well mm -hmm. <laughs> so when we talk about how we go into not just from being healthy from uh, a diet point of view mm -hmm. but also healthy from a chemically free Right. And, you know, a lot of us as adults, we don't understand how chemically, um, um, uh, and, and I, I'm trying to find another word um, other than addicted, um, dependent we are, because um, sugar is a chemical, and I can't, for the life of me, get away from sugar. I'm trying, though. <laughs> I am trying. So I have reduced my sugar intake, but even those things. Um, are not healthy for us. And um, what happens, part of the trauma that we have experienced as a people, uh, sort of the symptoms of it are chemical dependency and alcoholism. And, um, and some, that's the way some folks cope with some of the trauma that they have lived or um, are, are still living with. Um, and it's generational in our families, and we can trace it back. And um, there is some research that says, um, you know, when you have one um, alcoholic, I'll say one alcoholic, but one chemically addicted person, that it, and it takes about three generations to work that itself out. Well, we have some generations that have multiple alcoholics in that particular family. So then that's continued trauma upon trauma. And the way you deal with that is what you have seen. What, what I've said is if the kids um, role model what they see, or the parents are role modeling and kids are seeing that. So if you, if, if, if the way mama coped was to get a bottle, then the way you gonna cope is to get a bottle or to get a, a blunt or something. So um, we have a lot of chemical de dependency in our, in our families. Um, and uh, the way we, what we want to do is to promote um, chemically free lifestyles, which includes all those other things. So cigarettes is, you know, uh, I smoked when my kids were younger. Um, and thank God for my kids, because they had some program, and they must have said, you know, every time your mother light up a cigarette, start choking. <laughs> because every time I did that, my youngest would be like, oh my, she's like, she's gonna pass out. But um, I had some other circumstances that encouraged me to, to stop smoking, and I stopped smoking. But I know that I have friends who, who've continued to smoke, and their kids now smoke. So when we start talking about good, healthy habits, we're talking about what we're role modeling for our children and um, 
and what they're picking up from us. So if we eat well, they eat well. If we use chemicals, the likelihood that they will use chemicals is greater. If we smoke cigarettes, the likelihood that they will smoke is greater. And, and they might not smoke cigarettes, they, they, but they might smoke something else. Okay. So um, we want to be able to promote that, but ultimately, um, you know, if you're not healthy, you, there's a whole lot of things that happen when you're not healthy. You can't, you know, it might impact your employment, your ability to take care of your own family, even your ability just to interact with your family, let alone just um, working and taking care of them. So what we want to do is promote those healthy habits early on so that they pick those up and those things, they carry those, them into adulthood. Okay. Avoiding street pressures. Okay. That's one. Um, and, the, you know, we talk about that because the streets for a lot of African-American kids are real. Because by and large, in, in, in large cities, and Rochester is a, considered a mid-sized city, but it also has the same characteristics of some large cities, you have African-Americans that are concentrated in particular areas. And some of those areas um, experience a lot of um, um, some crime, and on some unsafe conditions in those neighborhoods. And so what we want to do is also teach parents how you help your kids avoid participating in um, negative activities out in the community and how can they avoid some of those things that are going on in the street. Um, and it, a lot of it has to do, again, with role modeling. So um, they're not seeing us participate in some of those activities. Um, we're having good and open discussions about that. Um, you know, one of the, um, my, I would have conversations with my um, daughters when we would be riding through the community about what they saw and, um, and some of the things that they picked out in terms of what was negative about the neighborhood, um, we, you know, we were just, we had those conversations and what did we want to see? So like one, one of my daughter said one time, um, why why is it that um, you can tell when something is wrong when you see a grown man riding a bicycle with dress shoes? And so, and I said, well, well, well what do you mean? She said, well, wh why wouldn't he have on sneakers? Because riding a bicycle is a, um, a um, that's like sports. That's, that's outside playing. And, um, and I remember how when my father and his brothers were young, they would ride uh, bicycles to get back and forth to work, right? Now that was on the island, so they could do that. Um, but here, our kids see things differently. So it might be a mode of transportation. What our children see is, okay, that's a, a, something's wrong with that, that black man because you're not supposed to be riding a bike with shoes on. And when you really think about it, these are the things that happen in kids' minds. Mm -hmm. So it's an opportunity for us to have a dialogue about that. Um, and possibly about that man's situation. But when we don't, we act like they don't see it, um, you know, that's not the truth. They, uh, we have to have conversations with them and encourage them that's not their, where they're going and that they're going um, to a different place. Actually pouring into our kids and um, helping them by uh, um, de defining for them what their expectations we have for them. So when you have a, um, you know, you have a child and you want that child to grow up and go to college, you start saying that from the moment that they're born. And when they're two years old, they understand, okay, well, I'm going to college. And when they get older, they understand what college is, but they know that's the expectation for them to go. Sometimes our conversations with them are, you're going to college, and it starts when they're in the ninth and 10th grade. That's too late because they don't see that as a, a, the expectation. They have other things. So. It is, if we're gonna help them avoid um, street pressures, then we need to really start speaking into them what we expect for them to be when they get older so that they, they understand that I'm transcending this, I'm going somewhere else. You know, th that's a very valid point, um, having meaningful conversations mm -hmm. with your children, and especially as you're driving through the neighborhood, exactly. how are they perceiving what it is that they see? Mm -hmm. Because as I'm sitting here listening to you, I, never gave it a second thought mm -hmm. because I see one thing but never really giving any consideration to how my children right. could be perceiving what they're seeing. Right. And I see that that's a very valid thing that we should be talking, especially 
Um, I, I would like to know what children think when they're seeing grown men hanging out as they do on Jefferson Avenue. Yeah. I wonder what that dialogue is. How, what, what are they seeing think, there? Right. What do they think about that? And I think that those are great things. Mm -hmm for parent and child to talk about. Right, and it, it, does, it does two things. Um, actually, more than that, but two, the two that come to mind is it helps to um, uh, create a, a dialogue. You know, we have a, um, one of the strategies we use is chit-chat time. And chit-chat time can happen in the car, it can happen as, while you're shopping or as you're just putting away groceries and it's, you're really trying to, you know, how did it go today and that kind of thing instead of, you know, saying, let's sit down and talk about what happened. Uh, they already have a red flag. Okay, now I know you're trying to get at something. <laughs> but if you, you know, while you're in the midst of something, kids will share a lot with you. And, and so it's not only about what they share with you, it's about how you react. Because if you react like, you know, like something is wrong, that, that, that child is going to shut down. So we encourage that kind of healthy two-way dialogue, not just one-sided. Um, one but the other thing, it teaches our children how to think critically. So when they see something, you know, first of all, kids are amazing in terms of how they perceive something. We think that they are not, but they actually are. But if you start having healthy dialogues about certain things that they see, you can teach them how to think critically, which is a tool that they need. Too often when kids see things and say, you know, uh, mommy, why is such and such and such and such? Our response is, you're trying to be too grown. Get out of grown folks' business. Shut up and sit down. And it really should be, well, why are you asking me that? What did, you know, what did you see? Sometimes we will learn more of what our kids are exposed to um, just by having that, that dialogue. But it gives us an opportunity to either confirm or um, sort of move their thinking in another direction so that they can think beyond that particular level in terms of what they just see at the gut level. Um, and it's a really strategic developmental tool to have with our children. And the fifth one was to teach good study habits. Okay. Um, and uh, we do that because, again, role modeling, all of it's based on, on role modeling. So if we want our kids to do well in school, then we have to teach uh, good study um, habits. And sometimes that's as simple as when they're sitting down doing their homework, you're reading. You're taking advantage of that time because they see that you value literacy and reading, then it becomes a value to them. Um, uh, making sure that they have, you know, adequate um, room and space to do their homework, um, being active and involved with the, with the schools. One of the things that we do in one of our orientations was in a separate program is to teach parents how to review the report card and to have what kind of dialogue that they need to have with the, the teacher. Not that we're teaching them, we're just giving them things to say, you know, think about doing it this way. Because oftentimes parents go to the bottom line on a report card. We use that as the tool. They go to the bottom line on a report card and they see, oh, okay, their student has you know, um, you know, a 2.9, uh, okay, which is not, not bad, it's just right under a B, but you might want them to be, to do more, but you might be satisfied with that. But then when you look at the um, individual classes and look at, oh, they got an F here, and they got an A here, so you see where some of this, uh, how, how it sort of evens out, but you have to look at the, the comments on the report card. And then the conversation with the teacher is, what's the behavior? that you're seeing. Because often when my kids were in school, I'd be, why, why do you have this? Why, is this? why does it say this on here? And uh, my daughters would, you know, all kids say this, okay? The teacher doesn't like me. <laughs> that's, the, that's the classic um, uh, standby. And, uh, and that might very well be true because all teachers don't love all kids. And I'm not anti-teacher. I just know that not to be the case. Um, but there's something more that's going on other than my teacher doesn't like me. So you want to get to what is the behavior, because you can address the situation if you can get to the exact behavior. You can't address it if it's, my teacher doesn't like me, so that's why they put that on there. So we talk to parents about what kind of dialogue to have with teachers about what it is that teachers are seeing. And so that you, you and the teacher are on the same page. That does two things. One, it has, you know, once you start having that conversation, there are two adults that are working in this, uh, you know, uh, are, are supposedly working on the same uh, strategy, moving in the same direction for the same child. 
Um, but you, it gives parents the power to have some control over that conversation or the dialogue that's going on between the teacher and the child. Sometimes I can assess and I can say, you know, as a parent, okay, I, it seems to me you don't like my kid. You know, parent, teachers hate that. They do. Um, and because they'll tell you that's not the case. Uh, but I've made an assessment, okay? And as the parent, I'm the expert on this child. The teacher is not the expert, the parent is. And then you can have a better dialogue with what you expect from the teacher because we should have expectations not just from the child, but also from the teacher. But the more we participate in the educational process, we reinforce for our children that education and studying um, are good things and that we expect certain things of them. So we reinforce that and they see our, they see our behavior and they're able to, to, uh, to uh, appreciate that. And um, a parent does not have to be a scholar or, uh, or have college degrees in order to have that conversation because again, the parent is the expert on the child. And it's, a, and it's an expectation for the parent to do that. In a nutshell, mm -hmm. what this is really bordering on, if we, or parents, have to be what they want their children to be. Well, um, yes, yes. Um, at least in those particular areas, mm -hmm. because we, the, the number one way that our children learn is by watching parents. So we can't expect our children to learn um, manners or how to, to uh, teach or how to um, um, speak uh, appropriately to adults if we're not teaching them how to do that. So, so another good thing is that we respect our elders. If we don't, we're not respecting our elders, our kids are not going to respect our elders. And it's actually, that's something that's a part of our, our African heritage, is that elders have an esteemed place in the community. Not necessarily like, like um, some of what happens here, um, where in, in a lot of cases you see um, elders, grandparents, and, and great-grandparents who are sort of left aside um, and are only engaged at certain times. And they're actually key parts of the family. So we know that that's part of our, our heritage, and we should teach that to our children, that they should respect elders because they hold an esteemed place and because it's part of our heritage, not just, just because you should, but it's part of who we are as a people. And so we should role model that for our kids. It's all good stuff that we're supposed to be role modeling. We want our kids, I don't talk to any parents that say, I don't want my kids to go to college. Now, when they get older, they might say, well, you know, maybe they don't, everybody doesn't need to go, or maybe everybody doesn't have to go. But they all want their kids to aspire educationally. It doesn't mean that you have to have, have done that, but it means that you value that to such a degree that you put those things in place so that kids understand that's your expectation for them. Okay. Is there a cost associated with this? There is not. Um, we try to make it as, as, as easy as possible. And just let me say that we have a program, uh, a new program will be starting February 27th. So we are looking for, um, we typically enroll um, between 20 and 25 uh, parents in the program. It's free of charge. Um, it will begin February 27th. It's every Monday for 12 weeks. And it's from 530 uh, to 730. And, um, there is a book provided, and we, um, they don't have to pay for the book. Um, we provide childcare, and we provide a meal. And um, we also can provide some assistance with transportation. So we're right downtown, so we give bus passes to go back and forth if, if parents need that. Uh, so we make it as simple as possible to come. And at the end of the program, for folks who complete it, we raffle off uh, recycled laptops. So we had... Um, we had a really good session. We just ended one session in December. And um, we, when we were doing the raffle, uh, you know, everybody doesn't get a laptop, but um, we had a, 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 a photograph. We took a photograph of someone who won the uh, laptop, and she was off the floor, like around two feet. <laughs> you, we got her in midair. Um, but it's a, uh, you, at the end of the session, they have developed a relationship and um, often want to continue to do some more training. And for those who are ready, 
uh, the Parent Leadership Training Institute would be an ideal transition for them if they're ready for that, that level of, um, of involvement and leadership. But it's always been, at the end of it, they always want to continue. Okay. Um, can you tell us some of the successes? Because I, I would imagine the parents, after they, they complete this 12-week course, I guess you see the immediate transformation um, of coming to life or light shining. Well, uh, the, the and, and I believe that this is the goal of all the curriculum, so um, that one of the things that happens is the the group sort of forms, you know, this is the whole group development process, so there's a forming and then there's a storming and norming and then they're performing. Really by the time they get to the end of it, um, they are working, they have become each other's support system. So and I mentioned earlier that, you know, mom and them and, and grandmama, big mama, they might no longer exist, but this group becomes that support network for these these families. And um, they, um, so there's two things. One, we sort of say, okay, you're, you're good, go off and, and, uh, and prosper. And um, so they go, oh, we could, well, when is the next thing? Do we want to come back? And we really try to tie them into all of the things that, are, that speak to them culturally, like the African-American things that are going on in the community, because they need some help in terms of doing that. And you, can, you know that those things are not readily available. Like someone says, well, how do I continue this walk in terms of pride and blackness? Uh, you need some help. You need someone to give you some resources and connect you to some things. So we try to connect the families to some of those things. Um, what happens right midway, um, the parents have figured out, okay, well, I can be honest here. If I'm gonna get some help, I really need to be honest with what, what's going on. Probably about like the fourth or the fifth week. And then by the time they've gotten to like the eighth week, they're really looking at this is the behavior because we really try to get them to hone in on something that they want to change um, and try to make it as specific as possible. Because in the beginning, a lot of parents might say, I just don't, I'm just, I want them to listen to me. You know, I don't, I'm tired of whooping them. I want them to just listen. That's too narrow. That's, I mean, that's too broad. You really have to narrow that. Um, and I use, I'll use one of my experiences. Um, I had, when, when my girls were growing up, and this is, my, my daughter was, was older. She was a young adult, but still living at home. Um, and I would have this thing, uh, clean the kitchen, okay? I want you to, when I come home, I want the kitchen cleaned, all right? And if the kitchen's not clean, I don't cook. So I went for a long time without having to cook anything. Um, but the kitchen, when I say clean the kitchen, what my daughter heard was wash the dishes. What I thought I was saying was wash the dishes, wipe the counter down, wipe the stove off, get the floor done, all these other things. Now really, if you home all day and you using up all this stuff, you should get it back to the way it was last night, right? So that's not what she would hear. So she heard wash the dishes. And um, so, to aggravate me, that I'm saying to aggravate me, because that's what I think it was, there would be, the dishes would be washed, but you know how you rinse out the sink, right? So there's stuff in the sink and suds and all this other stuff. Nothing else is done. And I would say, I told, no, no, and, and I'm, 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 um, I'm, I'm misspeaking here. I would say, wash the dishes. What she heard was wash the dishes. What I thought I was saying was clean the kitchen because washing the dishes meant cleaning the whole kitchen to me. That's how I grew up. So I would come home and the dishes would be washed, but that's it because that's all I said. And um, so I, the, in terms of getting her to do what I want, I had ended up, now she's a grown woman now, so I'm saying stuff like, you, I'm gonna put you out, you know. You, I'm gonna knock you in your head. That's how we were having this little conversation. And it would get frustrating. And, um, I, and my husband would just be looking like, oh, I, I'm not even in this here. Okay. So um, I went through the training, and what I learned is, okay, I really need to be clear about what it is I want. And once I've said it, I don't need to keep going back and doing all those other things. So, but I also learned that I had to praise um, the first thing that I saw. Okay, so as when I was growing up, I didn't get a whole lot of praise because I got praise with constructive criticism because you needed to know how you could do that, but how do, how do you improve? Um, so, but I learned how to 
the, the correct steps for effective praise. And, um, and I tried it the very first time. I said, try it the very first time. And I tried those steps the very first time. I walked into the house. The dishes were done. The rest of the kitchen was a whole a big mess. But I said, thank you for washing the dishes, OK? And, and I, so I always tell the story because it was amazing to me. This is what sold me on the curriculum. So guess what my daughter said when I walked in? It was like it was normally is, and normally we were having a battle. But I walk in this time, and I say, thank you for washing the dishes. What did she do? She said, you've got something else you need me to do. Now, but I had learned how to praise effectively, and there are steps to it. I didn't know that before. And I learned those steps when I went through the, the training. So she's a grown woman. If it can work on her, okay? <laughs> I, I, I really have a lot of faith in the curriculum. Also, I see two, two good components uh, to this program. There's a networking mm -hmm. that they, the parents develop. Mm -hmm. And because of the network that the parents develop, now gives the children of those parents a network yep. mm -hmm. to reinforce those positive things. As I started out early saying that I'm not a, a big supporter of government programs, but when I listen to you and understand this program, this is an amazing thing because what this allows for to happen is that if you make a better parent, mm -hmm. you're going to have a better child. If you have a better parent and child, that makes for a better family. Mm -hmm. And if you have a better family, that makes for a better citizen and a better community. Absolutely. And if you have a better citizen and community, you now have a better city. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is something that when we look at the bigger picture, what this is all about is basically making our city better. Absolutely. That's exactly what it's doing. And um, I would say that for a long period of time, and the city's not the only one that's doing that, um, for a long period of time, we went on the premise that we need to serve kids. So we did what we thought was best for children. And not that that was wrong, but you cannot serve children like they don't exist in families. And, and by and large, the programs, schools, um, all of these um, institutes, institutions that actually serve children only have children for a short period of time. The family has them the, the bigger period of time. And so if we think we're just gonna work with kids with, without families, then we're, we're not doing the right thing. And so not just the city, the county, the school district, everybody is looking at how do we incorporate parents, um, not just as partners in what we're doing, but really to, to uh, reinforce what they have and to let them know that we understand and know that they are the primary caregivers. They are the first teacher, the first and the last. So what we should be doing if we want better outcomes for our, our children, th they might belong to the parents, but they're all the community's children, that we provide support for the parents as well. Now, we, don't, we ain't going to do it for you, okay? <laughs> but we can give you some tools to make your job a lot easier, and that's what we should be doing. And, you know, I, I heard you say that in the beginning. I was like, hmm, okay, not a good supporter of government programs. Uh, a lot of what we are doing is, uh, is excellent stuff. Exactly. Excellent stuff. So. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show. We are going to be doing a segment once a month mm -hmm. pertaining to this, and we're going to have Mrs. Campbell come back and give us some more information on how to become effective parents so we can have an effective community. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. My pleasure, and I appreciate the invitation. Thank you. It's not only children who grow, parents do too. As much as we watch to see what our children do with their lives, our children are watching us to see what we are doing with our lives. Life affords no greater responsibility, no greater privilege than the raising of the next generation. Affirming words from moms and dads are like light switches. Speak a word of affirmation at the right moment in a child's life, and it's like lighting up a whole room full of possibilities. As you know by now, with each passing sunset, brings a new sunrise and it's a new day. I'll see you next week. Be blessed.